Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here. My name is Lara Snatager. I'm head of program at What Design Can Do. What Design Can Do is an international organization that advocates using the power of design to, uh, for societal change and climate action. And today we are here together to, um, to discuss the uh, question, why is design crucial in the transition to a fair and sustainable world? And we are doing that with this fantastic panel, which I would like to introduce to you. Um, first of all, I would like to introduce you to uh, Vice Minister Marta Delgado Peralta, who is the Vice Minister of Multilateral Affairs and Human Rights uh, of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Mexico. Um, Vice Minister Delgado is an internationally renowned environmentalist with over 29 years of professional experience in public service. And before she became Vice Minister of Multilateral Affairs and Human Rights for the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs of Mexico, she was Minister of Environment of Mexico City. Then our second guest on the panel is uh, Truus Huisman. She is uh, Chief Communications Officer of the IKEA Foundation. Uh, and Truus has over 25 years of experience in communications with a specialization in sustainability and communications. So, welcome. And last but not least, Richard van der Laken, who is a uh, graphic designer with his own studio for more than 25 years, and also co-founder and CEO of What Design Can Do. Um, he founded What Design Can Do 10 years ago out of the necessity to bring the creative power of design to help combat big societal issues that the world is facing today. So, welcome everybody. Um, we also recently started a multi-year partnership with the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs under the name of DICES, which stands for Design for Inclusive, Creative and Ecological Sustainability. With this partnership, we aim to expand our global network of creative designers to stimulate collaboration, innovation and knowledge sharing on the role that design can play in climate action and the realization of the SDGs. And in the light of this partnership, um, we invited Davy van der Weerde, um, who is, sorry, I forgot to, the slides. Uh, Davy van der Weerde, who is um, ambas the Dutch ambassador for international cultural cooperation. But she unfortunately could not make it to the COP, so she left a message for us. Which will start now, I hope. My name is Davy van der Weert, and I'm the Netherlands Ambassador for International Cultural Cooperation. I'm honored to have the chance to speak to you today at the start of your session on creative climate action. Climate change affects us all and demands our urgent attention. The Netherlands is committed to SDG 13 and has adopted a whole society approach to combat climate change and its impacts. The fact that I am speaking to you today demonstrates this approach because it means that we have to involve all kinds of actors. Part of my mission as a cultural ambassador of the Netherlands is to support creative initiatives that offer innovative solutions to global threats and challenges. The cultural field can play a very important role in bringing about the societal changes we need in order to adapt to a sustainable way of life. Art plays an important part in creating awareness about the urgency to change by offering people experiences and insights that may have more impact than words. Artists and designers also have the ability to look beyond the boundaries of the present and come up with creative out-of-the-box solutions that are fit for the future. This is why we are very excited about the Netherlands collaboration with What Design Can Do, because it offers a platform for the creative thinking power that our world needs to adapt to climate change. And it does so by bringing together creatives from all over the world. One example is a project supported by What Design Can Do and our Dutch Embassy in Tokyo in Japan. As part of the No Waste Challenge, Project R created an experimental community center that invites people to learn, think and practice sustainable lifestyles together. The space features interiors and furniture made from waste materials and it hosts a variety of online and offline activities, from second-hand markets to repair workshops and composting classes. In doing so, it familiarizes people with sustainable ways of living. 
By supporting what design can do and its partners, the Netherlands hopes that more of such inspiring projects will see the light and uh, we can play a part in bringing about a more sustainable future. I hope that your workshop today is inspiring and maybe even leads to some interesting new collaborations. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dewi. We are very much looking forward um, uh, to the coming years of this partnership. Um, I would like to explain to you what we are going to do today, um, the program of this session. First of all, uh, uh, Richard is going to give a presentation um, to give a little bit more uh, background and context of the theme of Design for Change for this session. It will be followed by a panel conversation with our three guests and then we would like to include you as an audience in an interactive discussion as well because we are really looking forward to meet you and hear about your experience with uh, design, uh, design for uh, climate action and we will wrap up with a reflection after that. Um, so, Richard, can you please take over and give your presentation? Sure, I can do that. Thank you so much, Lara. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, and a special hello to Trus and Marta. So great that you're here in this, uh, in this total chaos here. Um, for me, it's the second time uh, at COP. Uh, two years ago, I was in Madrid, also sort of uh, uh, overwhelmed by what was happening here. So this time, I'm wearing my yellow suit but in all the stress I ripped out of my pants. So I'm going to show that to you later. My daughter polished my nails, so I'm ready to be here. Um, so let's start. I, I thought I'm going to explain you a little bit more about what design can do and what the organization is all about. Um, so what you can read here, what design can do is an international organization that seeks to accelerate the transition to a sustainable, fair and just society using the power of design. We, at this moment, are based uh, not only in the Netherlands, maybe you can hear that from my accent, I'm from Amsterdam, but we're also based in Sao Paulo, Mexico City, New Delhi, Nairobi and Tokyo. Um, what I always find very important to, to mention is that uh, we started 10 years ago and we, uh, uh, we are designers. This organization is, is uh, uh, initiated and organized and, and run uh, by designers. So it's really design driven by nature. Um, and our vision is a design driven uh, world that is sustainable, inclusive, just and safe. To give you a little bit of an insight on how that all goes, I also have a little video, so I would ask the, the technician to, to pump up the volume a little bit, and then um, here we go. At What Design Can Do, we believe that design is more than making pretty things. Design and creativity have the power to transform societies. Money, the government, science, or the United Nations cannot solve the problems of the world alone. We need design and creativity to come up with alternative strategies, fresh ideas, and provocative thoughts. What Design Can Do organizes annual conferences in Amsterdam, Mexico City, and Sao Paulo. Speakers from all over the world share their visions. What Design Can Do is the perfect place for designers and creatives, as well as businesses, industry, NGOs, and governments to explore and start using design innovation. The What Design Can Do websites, blog, and social media are engaged platforms for discussions on design and issues like climate change, social justice, health, and well-being. To actively search for fresh ideas and insights, What Design Can Do organizes global design challenges around the big issues of today. We ask the design community to come up with new answers to questions like the integration of refugees and climate change. We challenge creatives to upload their ideas to our website. An independent jury selects the best ideas to enter an acceleration program to develop them into viable products and business cases. In the near future, What Design Can Do plans a series of local challenges around energy and safety in metropoles on five continents. And a new series of conferences is being launched in Mexico City. To see how you can join our movement, visit whatdesigncando.com. So that gives you a bit of an insight, a visual insight of what we do. Um, I can imagine that you have a question, why in God's name design? Well, everything around us is designed. The, the chair we sit on, the clothes we wear, 
the phone we use, also the software that we use, everything, everything is designed. And from that perspective, we always say that you can never underestimate the importance and the impact of design because it's omnipresent. We're always surrounded by design. Um, but that has a positive but also a negative side. You could say uh, that um, uh, design also did bad things. And for that reason, we developed a, uh, a big program that's called the No Waste Challenge. And again, to give you a bit more insight on that, I have a new video to share with you. I was taught to design trash. And I've designed trash. I have been a bad designer. But haven't we all been bad? Because at the end of the road, everything we design ends up as trash. Design turned out to be a very sufficient to change. Design is having a responsibility in the waste cycle. 91% of all the plastic in the world is not recycled. And 30% of all our food is lost or wasted. Waste is an idea. It's something that we invented. We can uninvent it. So we need to design in a different way. We need to redesign our relationship with things, with products, with service. We need new ideas and we need them now. And that's where you come in. Be bold, be curious, and be ambitious. Join the No Waste Challenge. Join the No Waste Challenge. And get to work, because there's no time to waste. Well, I can tell you that uh, this, uh, this whole challenge program uh, uh, delivered quite some uh, results. We got 1,409 entries from 105 countries. Uh, all from designers, creative startups that want to work on tackling the waste crisis. So I think that's a beautiful result. Um, important is that designers are able to pair imagination with problem solving abilities. Um, uh, and for that reason, we think it's extremely important to involve designers and the design community at large so that together we can design this better future. Um, so how are we going to do this? Well, we have to rethink and redesign everything. Probably not new for you, but that's really something that we need to work on. How do you do? Yes, and that is also great fun. It's really nice to work on new things, to explore, um, to turn problems into challenges, into opportunities, so that we really can design this better and desirable future. So, for example, how are we going to rethink and redesign the way we cool our homes? Um, one of the winners of our uh, previous challenge that was focusing on clean energy um, is called uh, Beehive. That is a, a project from, uh, from Delhi. Um, it's a beautiful uh, a, a, a project that's an alternative for air conditioning. And it combines a very old knowledge, um, a, a pottery, and water, and when you combine this, when you pour water over this pottery, you create a cool air. And um, um, the nice thing is that, uh, that Beehive combined um, uh, 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 this project in, in public space, but that they also made a version that you can uh, use in your own home. But for example, also, how are we going to deal, how are we going to rethink and redesign our energy needs? Um, this project is called Power Plant. It's from a Dutch designer, Marjan van Aubel, and it's the world's first self-powering greenhouse. And what is so beautiful about this project is that she combined technology with design. So what you see here is a greenhouse. It's, it's made with, uh, so with glass, and this glass is in fact a solar panel. So imagine what can happen if you're able to scale this up. And her ideal is that at the end uh, uh, of 2030, or maybe a few years later, we all have our uh, self-powering greenhouses on the top of our house, in our garden, etc., etc. But also, how are we going to rethink and redesign our interior? Um, one of our winners uh, uh, of, the, of the No Waste Challenge is called MAPU. They make sound systems. It's a little 
little pause so that we can think about this beautiful project. Um, sorry? This was bad software design, indeed. So we try it again because it's really a nice video. No, I th I'm afraid it's not going to work. Never mind. Because this is a beautiful project. It's about, uh, they make speakers, they make sound systems. Uh, they do that in Chile with the local population. It's completely, uh, it's 100% com done with natural materials. So you can reuse it. It's, it's, uh, it's completely sustainable and very important. It's a beautiful project that delivers amazing sound. And again, that's, that's the, the desirable future that I'm talking about. So you, you can rethink and redesign everything in a sustainable and beautiful way. And how are we going to rethink and redesign death? Also an important one. Um, this is a living coffin. Is, is that Still working, okay, great. This is a living coffin uh, 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 developed by a Dutch designer. And this coffin, coffin is made out of fungi, fungi, fungi. So what happens is that um, uh, when people die, because finally that happens with people, um, you can order this coffin. <laughs> yeah, it's true, Marta. Um, you can order this coffin, and the, the good thing about this coffin is that it's, it's strong. It can carry a human body. You can be buried in it, and after four weeks, this coffin is completely gone. It does not leave any trace. There's no footprint. There's no impact. That's what I call redesigning life and redesigning how we deal with death. And finally, that's of course what we are aiming at. We're aiming at a better future for all with the power of design. And that also um, works. Uh, we have supported and helped developing uh, designers and startups um, uh, uh, making an impact, making success of their, um, uh, of their projects and initiatives. And as you can see here, 80% of the outcomes of the, of the, of the, the startups that we support are still uh, making a living. They are successful, they are building their, um, uh, their company. What you can see on the right side is that more than 10 million euros already has been invested in these design-driven initiatives. And also, for example, when you look at, uh, at our social media, it resonates well with our community with an average of 50 million impressions on our social media channels. Um, so, for the future, let's embrace the changes that are needed and let's do that with the power of design. Thank you so much. Thank you, Richard. I think uh, this was a very... Uh, uh, um insightful presentation um, and I would like to continue now with the panel discussion unless there is anybody who already has a question now about this presentation okay then we will later involve you in a discussion as well so I would like to start um, with you Vice Minister uh, Delgado um, as Vice Minister of Multilateral Affairs and Human Rights um, you are responsible for Mexico's foreign policy in collaboration with multilateral organizations and uh, for the country's international commitments regarding human rights, climate change, gender equality, and dialogue with civil society, among many other things, of course. Um, I was wondering, with which goals did you come to this COP26? Oh, where's, oh, th your fo there's an extra phone there, I think. Okay, it's for you, okay? I share with him. No, no, yes, sure. Okay, thank you very much. It is a privilege for me being here and also uh, I am very, very happy because uh, we have uh, worked together for a couple of years and uh, my boss is the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Mexico, met Richard in Amsterdam during an event of what design can do. Uh, he was a f the, min the uh, uh, mayor of Mexico City back then, afterwards he became the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And uh, right now we are committed to 
increase the creativity of the uh, policies that we want to support, not just for here, for the Conference of the Parties, but at the multilateral arena. I think that we have to gather all the creativity needed to really craft uh, very different solutions. We have been in COPs since 26 or more years ago. My first one was in 1999, COP5, Bonn, Germany. And uh, it has been a long, a long way to get uh, Glasgow uh, and uh, a lot of ideas that I have heard through these years we have been able right now to, to apply those ideas. So we are very inspired by this uh, specific initiative uh, regarding how to redesign, redesign of our, our way of living, redesign our foreign policy, redesign our commitments, because uh, we have realized recently that they are not enough. And uh, the uh, spirit of Mexico right now is also to uh, improve our, com our compromise with people. Because at the end of the day, we cannot uh, just get targets of reduction of emissions or financing without thinking that we have communities and risk and we have to think about people. So everything must be redesigned also for their well-being. Yes, okay, that's very clear. You already answered all the rest of my questions with that answer, so thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. I also have a question for you, uh, Trus. Um, um, why, why does IKEA Foundation invest in creative solutions? Well, first of all, hey, everyone. Hey is hello in Swedish. We're very pleased to be here uh, this afternoon. And um, let me kick off by saying that as IKEA Foundation, our mission is to improve livelihoods on a livable planet. And in particular for children living in the most vulnerable parts of the world. And climate change, of course, is one of the biggest threats to the future of children. But often when we talk about climate change, we tend to fall back into quite technical terms. And those technical terms, and, and, and Madam Vice President, um, I fully concur with you when you said that people have to be at the heart of um, everything we do. But often the language we use, and the power of language is so important, creates a distance. And so design creativity can help bridge that gap. And naturally, as an, as an uh, organization which um, comes out of IKEA originally, IKEA, of course, the mother of design for people, and I'd like to refer to what our founder, Ingvar Kamprat, Ingvar Kamprat was the founder of both IKEA and the IKEA Foundation, said, good design inspires imagination, but excellent design inspires a better life. And so that inspired us to, to think about, well, what if we could crowdsource solutions by calling upon the creative and design community to develop solutions, creative solutions, to tackle the biggest challenge, climate change in the world. And so the journey started there, and it's been, I think, an amazing journey um, together. And now, and of course, Richard already referred to that, six countries being part of the, um, um, of, of the organization with, uh, um, on five, spreading over five continents. And we have seen some amazing uh, results already coming up out of the uh, previous three climate-related um, challenges, one around general climate change, of course, and then renewable energy, and the last one around waste. And we are so excited and grateful to be part of this initiative and to be supporting that community of socially inspired and creative change makers. And um, yeah, we're looking forward to, um, to continue the collaboration. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that elaborate answer. I have another question uh, for you, uh, Truus. Uh, what do you think is needed to unlock the potential of design for climate action? 
Look, I think the, uh, and I will try to be a bit shorter, sorry about that. Um, no, so, no problem um, at all. <laughs> the, um, the, of course, creators, they naturally are working hard on doing things differently. But of course, the nature of the problem and the challenge is so big that they often also need a little bit of guidance to enable them to focus. And that's, I think, what you guys, what design can do, have been f fabulous at in developing briefs and support to, to, to help that uh, create that, that focus on in order to develop the solutions. But of course, once the solutions are there, the next step is to make sure that those solutions actually become successful and that those social enterprises can flourish. Now, then of course, you're also looking at capital, you, but, more, but not only capital, you're also looking at other types of resources like partnerships, um, mentorship, and, and, and other sources of, of, um, of, of expertise. And I think that is why it is so important that by, what design can do has now started um, partnering with the Impact Hub. And I'm really looking forward indeed to, to seeing what comes out of that. Um, so, Yes, thank you for that. Um, um, I have another question for you, um, uh, Vice Minister. Um, I was wondering, um, what is your perspective on creative climate policies, how to um, insert creativity in climate policies? Well, um, I do believe that uh, there are a lot of uh, actions that we need to organize on the environmental agenda that are related to climate, but also the social and economic agendas. We have uh, the potential of uh, turning a lot of public policies into a climate friendly in initiatives or re for reducing GAG emissions or for adaptation. Uh, for example, the, and for middle income, com middle income countries, there is a, we have a less resources for investing in a single policy that can be also used for social and economic purposes. So uh, in Mexico, for example, we are thinking on policies that can benefit not just uh, for reducing emissions, but also socially and, uh, and the community uh, can be involved in those policies. The trade-offs of those uh, initiatives, for example, for reforestation, for the better management of ocean and fisheries, or for the waste uh, use are going to be not, not just to reduce emissions, but also getting a better uh, way of living of the communities. I, I want to put an example. How, what is a public policy that the city, a city can be creative with and uh, generate a lot of benefits? Uh, under the administration of uh, Mayor Ebrard, the current Minister of, uh, of Foreign Affairs in Mexico, the uh, market market was uh, established. The market market is asking people to bring all the waste separated, plastic, tetra pack, or uh, glass, aluminum, uh, any, any uh, waste separated. We weighed it and we uh, exchanged that uh, for money indeed, for a, buy, uh, a green point to buy green and organic food for the local uh, producers. So it is a very circular initiative that avoid uh, emissions, increase the earning of a local community, and also generate a better waste management. So those kind of policies can be uh, interesting also for climate purposes, but uh, I insist on the social perspective. Yes, thank you so much. Um, Richard, I also have some questions for you. <laughs> Um, I am, I'm also wondering for you, Richard, with, with which goal did you come to the COP? Yeah, um, I, I had some very clear goals, of course, showing my, my, the nails that my little daughter of did. But more importantly, um, uh, uh, and that is, that is something that, that I think we, we all, all have discussed already together, is that we all live in bubbles. So you could say that here at, at UNFCCC and at the COP, uh, uh, everybody lives in a so-called climate bubble. But we as designers, or we as creatives, uh, we also live in a so-called uh, creative bubble or in a design bubble. And there's a lot of, it's, 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 it's a huge um, uh, community. 
and look for example at the design weeks eh? every uh, self-respecting city in the world has a so-called design week and a lot of super interesting things happen there there's a lot of innovation going on there are a lot of uh, dedicated and and uh, designers and creatives working on the issues of our time but these these so-called bubbles never meet and for me it's important and for our organization as what design can do it is important that these different bubbles meet or that maybe at a certain moment we can also pop those bubbles and that we really can start working together so again for that reason I also think it's so 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 important that we work with an organization like IKEA Foundation or with the government of Mexico or the video that you saw that we are, that we also have a collaboration with the um, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the of the Netherlands impact up all kinds of organizations that have one goal and it is uh, 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 tackle climate change and all the social issues that that are connected with climate change yes okay um, I, I'm we're almost ready to involve you the audience but I, I also have one more question for you Richard um, so what have the past 10 years of running what design can do taught you about using the power of design for change what are the challenges for the creative industry to actually create impact yeah, well, in, in that sense, I, I already touched on that a little bit. Eh? The, 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 the design community lives in a bubble. And that means that, uh, again, there's a lot of exposure. There's a lot of innovation going on. But there are not really uh, uh, strong investment vehicles for design-driven innovation. And that, for us, as what design can do, is very important. So this is also really something that we want to start working on in the coming years. Uh, develop and create a serious investment vehicle so that as, as Truus already mentioned that we that what's happening on creative innovation that we can also support that and develop that so that we can really reach uh, scale I think that that's a very important challenge that the creative industry and the creative community still has to tackle so that would also be your answer if I ask you what you think is necessary uh, to unlock the potential of design for climate action, then this might be the answer. Yeah, so you, you, yeah, you could say that in the, in the design community, it's, it's a very rich ecosystem, but in that ecosystem, that specific thing is missing. Okay, thank you. Um, I think it's time because we, we, we started a little bit later. Oh, there's a question there. I'm, I'm coming to you because otherwise no one can hear you. Okay, so much of our uh, uh, economy around the world today is based on designed obsolescence, yeah. right? Um, how can we lower the carbon footprint um, in, a, in a world where so many jobs depend on designed obsolescence? No, I, I have a thought on that and uh, is here. We also have to educate the community to demand non-obsolete products. Because if the market is asking for the obsolescence of uh, some things, uh, and uh, the economy is really also providing incentives for that, then it's going to be very dif difficult for the market to adopt a non-obsolete product. So this is where, where the creativity and the education, the uh, awareness and the consciousness of community can get together, join together in order for the, the future of uh, the planet and the, the, for example, the waste management can be changed. Some people is really right now looking for things that are um, creative uh, and innovative, but also environmentally friendly. And that is because the awareness on climate change or environment we have worked on the last uh, decade. But we need more of that. And also be uh, also to sensibilize, sensibilize the, uh, the industries, the uh, CEOs, the uh, different companies that are producing things. When they feel a little pressure of community for specific things, they really can be really creative. I have, I have seen how, for example, Starbucks changed the uh, uh, 
uh, uh, their cups because of the consumer's pressure. They change it. And uh, we also, as consumers, can press the industry to be more creative. Thank you. I just noticed that the names are wrong. So this is not Trus and that's not Richard, but the other way around. So just to be clear, um, I think it, it would be nice to uh, um, continue with our interactive discussion. We put together some statements and we would like you to respond to them by using the cards that are below your chair so you can um, express your opinion on the statements that we uh, put together. Like to yes, we like to play a little bit oh, and also, oh, the people are now leaving, they don't want to be involved. <laughs> so um, that's also because we uh, want to get to know you a little bit better. So if I'm going to ask you something, please don't be shy, be honest and maybe also uh, tell us who you are and, and, and what you do. Um, so the first statement is when I think about design, the first thing that comes to mind is the red card, luxury products, the blue card, overproduction and consumption, the orange card is creative solutions for urgent problems, of course we all think about that, um, and the fourth one, the green one, is, is that you think the first thing that comes to mind are campaigns and infographics. Of course. <laughs> wow, that's interesting. So um, I see we have many people that think about campaigns and infographics. I'm really interesting, uh, interested in why... I, please hold your cards. Yes, may I ask you why you chose this one? I guess because the, the choice of design, you know, design touches all aspects of life, but I felt that this was actually one of the ones that was broader and probably, I am married to a designer, so that probably also influenced my thinking in this. Yeah. So you're probably married to a graphic designer. <laughs> Service designer. Ah. <laughs> of course. So thank you so much. Was there anybody with another color? Anybody with a cre uh, with overproduction. Yes, that was you. Why did you choose that? Um, I think, uh, especially uh, I'm coming from India and in Glasgow, you look, and I've spent a lot of time living in Mexico actually. So there is a part of the world which lives very simple life and which is very natural and pretty low carbon sustainable life. And then there is a part of the world which is overthinking, over designing, over narrating, over consuming. And the funniest thing about climate change is that the second world has taken over the narrative that should have actually been led by the first world. Yes, clear. Thank you. Let's go to the next statement. Unless there's someone on the panel who wants to respond as well. Or shall we go to well, the... Oh, you? I, I, I um, put on this, this one. Of course. Create a solution. Yeah. <laughs> but in, in fact, I didn't make a, jo uh, make a, jo a joke. Oh, I think yeah. it's, it's all, all of, the of above. these. Yes. Yeah, indeed. But I can But of course, for f f we all have different perspectives on what design is, and that's that's a very interesting question. Definitely. So let's move on to statement two. Statement two is: I have worked with designers before for climate action, or I have never worked with designers for climate action. Oh, so many people have worked with designers for climate action. Oh, that's great. I just see one person who hasn't. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, no, but uh, first I'm going to ask, um, oh, may, were you, did you have the red card? May I ask to uh, elaborate a little bit, uh, tell yeah. the story? Yeah. So I've primarily worked with people on like Instagram campaigns. So that's been like the really big thing for me, graphic designers specifically. Um, I've worked with a lot of like youth activism in climate and it's, it's such a big like part of that these days. It's like truly, if you don't have like a very accessible way of like communicating these issues people just won't listen so yeah that's clear thank you um and and there was one person who did not and i was wondering um you don't have to explain why you didn't but maybe you can explain or tell us if you now think it's a good idea to work with designers on climate action. Air, the, the lights, the sunlight and all of those things is minimal it's just sort of passed by 
Um, and that's, I think, quite worrying. So, yeah. So you are planning on using design for future solutions? Um, if we could, but I don't know how at the moment. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, the whole thing is designed to make rich people richer, in my opinion, <laughs> and uh, quite difficult to actually get a, a really comprehensive good design for the environment in. We try, uh, we do little bits here and there, but it's like open spaces and things, but it's nothing compared to what I would like to see. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, so let's go to the next statement. I've got to run. Um, so the next statement is. Oh, doesn't seem to work anymore. Oh, and there's no technician. Oh, yeah. there it is. So statement three is red is design is the problem, or blue design is the solution. Ah. Yes, that's clear. <laughs> so, um, you chose both. Can you explain why you chose both? Sure. Um, I think it was very clear from Richard's presentation that design is in everything. So, if we focus the creativity and the design power for good or for bad, can be the problem or the solution. So, we need to move towards only design as a solution instead of the problem, perhaps, right? Yeah. Okay, um, so I think everybody else had both as well. Um, maybe we, sh we should run a little bit through them because we are running out of time. The second, the fourth statement. Um, the, the clicker doesn't work anymore, I think. Can you help me? Yes. Okay, so, oh, this is also an interesting one, I think. Um, Designers could make most impact by designing sustainable solutions accessible for the entire world population, or they should focus on designing and galvanizing actions in their local area and community. Ah. Yes, thanks. I'm going to go to one of the people in the back. Um, so you chose a um, more locally focused uh, approach. Why? Uh, I find it like uh, uh, situation are very like from region to region and uh, especially like at a community level. So there's no like one solution fit all. So I think it's uh, it's reasonable to have the local specific design for s solution. Yes, that's clear. Is there anybody who, who thinks differently, who think that as a designer you should focus on designing for the entire world? Yes. Hi, I, I make floors that uh, generate energy from your footsteps. And we've just installed it at IKEA in Glasgow. And I like footsteps because everyone has them. It doesn't matter where you are. And I think the power of a designer is that if you can mass produce, uh, say, a, a car engine that didn't use fossil fuels, imagine the impact that would have had in the world. So I think it's about having the most amount of impact you could possibly have is about scaling big things that are really good for the environment. Yeah, clear. Okay. Anybody on the panel would like to respond to it? Yes. I think we um, are in a critical decade, and um, this is the, the next uh, years, 10 years, are indeed the most uh, critical years, crucial years for uh, climate change. So that's why I said, as designers, we need, or I'm um, I think we are all designers, that's why do we for. Um, what is required is that we focus on solutions that are scalable and that can be implemented fast. Yet, at the same time, and that's why I said you need the two, um, the two sides, um, we need to do design um, solutions that have people at the heart. Yes. And that means that you have to go to the communities and you have to be at where people are so the challenge here is that in reality we have to do both and we have to and i loved what richard was saying earlier we need to break through and also what the city council the elected uh, councillor said i think is we need to design holistic solutions and and get out of our bu bubbles and think creatively how we can leapfrog and make use of 
what we see as constraints as actually um, abundance. I heard that this morning someone saying that in some of the, the communities around the world that are energy uh, poor, what se in 75% of the case, there's actually an abundance of solar, wind, water. So it, it, it's, it is about um, designing the holistic solutions tackling the um, constraints, the challenges, as the stepping stone for solutions that are good for people and planet. Thank you. Very clear. Let's go to the next slide. Um, I think designers could achieve most impact by focusing more on these objectives. Focusing on advocating and campaigning for broad coalitions that commit to climate change. Or should they design solutions, should they focus on designing solutions for the adaptation to the impacts of climate change? Or green, they should focus on fostering behavioral change with the general public. Or blue, they should focus on imagining and visualizing alternative livable futures. Okay, I can imagine that you need to think about that for a little while. Oh. <laughs> oh. That's wonderful. I think almost everybody chooses all of them. <laughs> um, maybe, um, let's say, um, would you, oh, I think, you, yes, Vice Minister, I think you held up all cards, right? Except the last one. I am not sure about the last one. Maybe we can talk about it. Why not? Uh, because we are lack of time, you know, if we invest on visualizing alternative livable futures, we are really missing the opportunity of being here with the present. So it is, uh, I, 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 I guess that this idea is uh, useful and we need to do that. But uh, some part of my heart feels sad about that. Yes, I can imagine. Uh, because we are running out of time, there's no time to just imagine and visualize. We need to act now, right? Is there anybody else who would like to um, add something to this, respond to it? Otherwise, we will go, in, we will go to the next and last statement. So the panel already shortly discussed this. Um, unlock the promise of design by creating new collaborative organizational models for the creative industry and other industries and disciplines together? Or do you think the promise of design is mostly within galleries and collectors' context? So you don't think that design has a place in uh, climate action because it's more about uh, uh, making beautiful things, like you're a little bit of a skeptic? Uh, or green, um, the, we can unlock the promise of design by including design in long-term climate government policies. Or should we invest, financially invest, in design-driven innovation? What do you think unlocks the promise of design most? So I think nobody chooses the orange one, right? <laughs> yes, okay, so here are people, oh, you think all three, okay, that's clear. Is there someone who, who, who chose the orange one who thinks, I'm just skeptic, I don't think that design has a place in climate action, don't pretend that you can change anything with design. Okay, that's great, <laughs> that's great news. news. Yes, um, let me check, may I ask you to elaborate on your choices perhaps? I truly believe that uh, design can uh, offer a multidisciplinary vision that can be fruitful for all the three colors that I choose. I understand that it's not only about long-term uh, climate governance uh, policies, but also how to imagine solutions by organizing and uh, fostering ideas within organization, uh, foundations, government, and companies. So, Okay, clear. So. Anybody else who would like to respond now? Okay. Well, since we are running a little bit out of time, I keep saying that, um, let's do a little bit of reflection. Uh, first of all, I think 
at least everybody in the room believes that design can make a difference. That's a good thing to know. Um, and um, I also think that not all of th that a lot of people really think that design could be the solution more than that design is the problem. Or I think actually lots of people had both. Um, and um, let me check what statements. Oh yes, and actually I think with all these um, focus points, most of the people actually thought we should focus on all all together, we should not choose one uh, issue, uh, one challenge to focus on, but let's tackle all of them at the same time. So, in short, uh, that was the, uh, the the statements session. Now, I would like to know from you. Um, um, maybe I, I would like to ask you that first. Um, which point, thought, or observation that was shared today uh, will you take with you? Well, I think the uh, most important um, reflection I got from the audience is something which uh, stems me tremendously optimistic. I think the, um, the inspiration I got from the audience and their choices, the need to um, keep people at the heart of what we do, um, the need to act fast. We, have, we talk about waste as a resource for some new uh, products or services. But one thing which we don't have, we have no time to waste. And also the indication to collaborate together, is ex it speaks to my heart. So I think there are a number of reflections, but it's, I'm really, really so happy to hear this reflected by, the, by this audience. Okay, thank you. I also have a question for, uh, maybe one of the audience members would like to answer this. What inspired you during this session? Was there anything specific that inspired you? Not per se. Okay. Then, yes, okay. No, I actually have to say it was probably the reflection about how design can actually be incorporated into public policy. I had never actually thought about public policy, uh, uh, taking a design approach into public policy thinking and formulation. So. I think that's very positive. Yeah, that's great, indeed. Um, um, and is there anybody who um, has any critical thoughts you would like to share with us? Anybody in the audience that has a critical thought about what we just discussed? Or advice, maybe, to take with us? No. Ah, yeah. So I'd say it was inspiring hearing all the really cool design things you've been doing and the, the coffin that breaks down. That was really inspiring. But I think if you look at corporates and you know the logo above our head, how much real innovation is happening in that way by big institutions that is, you know, yours is wacky, it's cool, but that's what design should be. And I think big companies are not innovating like they say they are. And if you were head of Google, imagine how cool the products would be that would be, they'd come out with. Wouldn't that be fun and, and better for the planet as well? Anybody on the panel would like to reflect on that? Absolutely. Now, of course, this is not new for me, what you're saying, because I totally agree. And um, for us, that's also one of the bigger challenges. Uh, in a way, it's quite funny, but as you can see, we are uh, 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 collaborating with a fantastic organization like IKEA Foundation or with governmental institutions. That is something that those organizations, those bodies are... I think very aware, or maybe in that sense ahead of the curve, uh, but it's really difficult to to really hook up with uh, with the big companies. That that is also for us still a a challenge, so to say. Okay, I have one last question as a reflection for you, Vice Minister. Um, what would you uh, what would you say to designers and creatives who have the ambition to work on climate action? Is there something that you could say to them? to encourage them, perhaps, or? Well, I have two uh, reflections on that. The first one is regarding the fact that when we uh, faced the COVID, in one single year, we redesigned the life of a million people to overcome that crisis. And unfortunately, we have done that for climate while we know about the impacts of climate change since 30 years ago. And uh, I wonder why we are not really being creative enough or threatened enough to re 
change our way of living, our policies, our transportation, our everything. We are wearing masks. I mean, we changed everything because a single threat, and we have the climate threat, which is most the most uh, dangerous one, you know? So we, we have to think about that. And also for, for designers, I'm not one. Uh, I design public policies, maybe, but I am not uh, really with material things. And uh, sometimes the second and last comment that I have is, I'm not a religion, religious person, but if everything is designed in nature so perfect, why cannot we e evocate that or simil that as humans to really get in balance with our a, environment? Why we are so disruptive with this balance which is really designed by, by God or someone so perfectly? So we have to get inspiration on that how it works, how it is so perfect, and we have to really fit in uh, that perfection and that balance rather than as ju just uh, uh, being such aggressive with the environment. Thank you very much for that urgent but poetic encouragement. Um, with that, I also would like to end this session. And um, first of all, thank you, audience, for being so kind to uh, collaborate with us on this uh, topic. I would like to uh, thank the panel, of course. So uh, very happy with your uh, contribution to this session. Thank you so much. And also, um, if you have some tips or advice for us, we have some uh, papers here where you can leave that. Of course, we are around here as well, so you can also tell us. And also, if you want to be kept uh, informed by what design can do, please leave your contacts here or a card or write it down. And uh, we also would like to thank you with uh, a yellow book. What Design Can Do publishes uh, every year a yellow book about uh, circular uh, design and sustainability and design. So please get your copy and uh, hope to see you again. Thank you so much. <laughs>